I'd just like to uh, introduce you know, uh, Peter Chubb, who's the uh, principal, uh, or one of the principal uh, research engineers at CSIRO. Uh, he's doing a talk on uh, uh, life in the armory, which is from, you know, from what I read of the abstract, was, uh, you know, a bit being able to, you know, you know, quickly test the, you know, code that you've written from multiple platforms to. Um, Sorry, multiple processes without sort of... I think you better let me explain all that stuff. Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> I, I, okay I'm happy to do that. Okay. Okay, cheers, Peter. All right. All right. This is not working. Here we go. Um, two years ago at uh, Auckland, I spoke about SDHC cards and trying to get the best possible performance for your buck so that we could run a display on a Samsung TV because the browser that was built in sucked. So we wanted to put an embedded machine behind it. As a result, we can now display this kind of thing. And what I want to talk about today is some of the infrastructure behind getting these numbers up the top here. So what we have here is uh, the top left-hand corner is how many tests failed in the last run of our continuous integration system. The middle is whether the, pr the machine checked proof actually machine checked or not. And the third one on the right is how long it's been since we've actually made a release to the external GitHub repository for SEL4 and all of its um, stuff. Why is this not working? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. So, a bit of background. What we do is kernel development across a wide range of platforms. Our main kernels are SEL4, which is a microkernel in the L4 family of kernels. A microkernel doesn't do anything very much. All it provides is memory management and threads and interposes communication and a mechanism for giving capabilities out to different things so they can talk to each other. And that's about all it does. So you have to build systems on top. The main thing about SEL4 as opposed to all the other L4s is it has a formal proof associated with it that shows that the executable actually matches the C code which actually matches the Haskell intermediate specification, which matches the high-level specification. And because the machine protect proof has all these propositions about its behavior, you can build other proofs on top about information flow and safety and security and all those things you might want to know about a system. So that's SEL4. eChronos was also introduced, oh no, that was last year at, uh, at Geelong is another open source operating system. It's for embedded boards, which are NMU-less. And it compiles down to about 2K of RAM uh, and gives you all of the earliest deadline first rate monotonic scheduling that you want from a real-time operating system. And of course, Linux, which you all know about. So we want to be able to test all these things across a wide variety of systems. Here are some of them. So there, that's an Odroid XU. We grabbed it and we used it because it was the first commercially available cheap board that we could find that had the hypervisor extensions on ARM. That's a Sabre Lite. It's been our main platform for a long time. And we've got about 60 of these things that we hand out to university students to experiment with SEL4 and then get them back at the end of the term. That one there is an NVIDIA TK1. It's an ARM um, uh, Cortex A53. So it has the 64-bit and it has the uh, hypervisor extensions, but it's an in-order processor. That one there is a Hi-Key 96. It's much smaller than the others, about that big. Uh, it's the first available ARCH64 machine that we could find. We don't like it very much, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, that one there is a BeagleBone Black. The interesting thing about that one is that we didn't do the port for that one. Somebody out in community land did it, and I've forgotten his name, which is my, my bad, and then co contributed the code back to us. We don't maintain that port, but we don't want to break it without knowing that we've broken it. That one there is an Inforce IFC 6410. Uh, it's a crate processor, which looks a bit like an ARM V7A, but isn't. And so it's got some slight differences in the way that it, it works. And that one there is a Zinc FPGA board, where we're experimenting with offloading some of the kernel functions to the FPGA to try and speed things up. So far, with that particular board, the interposers of communication between the FPGA and the ARM core mean that we haven't got any gain, even though we can do operations 10 times faster. So, 
So what we're trying to do is continuous integration. What we want to do is catch breakages really, really fast. So if somebody's got a proposed commit and it breaks some board that they're not working on, we want to know about that so we can reject the patch and get them to fix it before it gets integrated. We also want to know what the current state is across all the platforms. It's not good enough just knowing what it is on x86. You want to know what it's like on x86 and on the Beagle and on the high key and all of them. And thirdly, we want to be able to measure the impact of new changes. So recently we've been trying to introduce ARCH64 support into the kernel. But doing that breaks some parts of the 32-bit support unless you rework them. And we want to know that. And it's not obvious to the people working on the ARCH64 port that it's going to break it. But if you can throw it on a test bed of machines, it'll come back fairly quickly and tell you that it's broken. And so you can fix it. But I hear you saying we've got that verified proof. Isn't self or guaranteed bug free? Um, yeah, the kernel itself, the verified part, is bug free. Oh, what's happened? Oh, there. It's back again. It's my fault. So, the reason that we still need to test is that we've only got one verified platform. At the moment, that's the Sabre Lite. All these other platforms, because they've got slightly different architectures, slightly different instruction sets, are not verified. Only that one is. All the other platforms are just best effort to try and keep them working and right. So we need to test. And of course, I just told you that. What second reason is that we're trying to build not just the cell 4 kernel, but systems on top. Typically, we run a virtualized Linux in an untrusted partition, and then some trusted, highly verified code in the other partition. And then we can provide information flow proofs about what information can flow between them. And if some nasty hacker manages to get into the Linux tree and break it, and we make it easy for our red, red teams to do this by giving them the root password, we can prove that nothing they can do can affect the stuff in the trusted partition. So when you're running on your helicopter, that's the unmanned little bird from Boeing, which runs our code, or your little drone, which is our experimental vehicle, because we can't afford to run that thing, <laughs> um, you can show that even if the Linux, which is doing the video capture and uh, high-level recording and interaction functions with the ground station, even if that dies, the thing will still obey its primary mission purpose and will still obey the geofencing rules you've put in there. And that's a really nice property to have, but you still need to test it. The second reason for testing is that we're in a research environment. And if you're in a research environment, you want to try things out and see what happens. Our main output is not the SEL4 kernel, even though that's one of the things we do. What our main output is as a research organization is clever stuff reported in peer-reviewed venues, whether it's journals or conferences. And that means that we uh, if you're a systems person, the best way to try out an idea is actually to build it. And then you can test it and find out what it really did. Otherwise, you end up at a theoreticians comp conference instead of a systems conference. So our proof and engineering teams are there to support research. And they do that in two ways. Firstly, by helping to try out the ideas and providing the infrastructure for the ideas. And secondly, by doing a little bit of contract stuff to bring in some money to support the rest of us. And I've said that we want to try out clever ideas. Oh, that's the other thing, yes. In order to verify something, it's a lot of hard work. It can take six person months just to verify three lines of code if that, those three lines are complicated. So you want to try things out and make sure they work before you try and verify it. It's a bit like pruning an orchard. So you've got your main line, which is the verified bit. And then from there, you've got a branch out here, which is trying out uh, untyped only memory, which is memory that's bigger than the kernel can support. And so we want to try, a, try and find a way of managing that. And we've got this other bit, which is all the real-time support. And we've gone through about four versions of that before we've got a version that we think we can merge in. And we've got the faster, faster, fast path bit, which is probably never going to be merged because when we tried it out, it ended up slower. But you don't know that until you've actually built it and tried it. 
So then you prune all those and prune them onto the verified branch. So the kernel engineers and researchers all experiment. Most of those experiments are thrown away. But a few, a very few, are queued for verification. And what happens then, if I can just go back again, what happens then while you're queuing for verification is the kernel people talk to the verification people and they say, um, here it is, nice and shiny and it works. We tested it. And the verification people look at it and say, Ugh, we can't prove that. Look, if you go through this code path, you're going to get a null pointer exception. Oh, we didn't think of that. We didn't test that bit. And then they say, uh, look, there's a buffer overflow over here. Fix it. And so you, 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 vote, you, you iterate, and you iterate until you get something which can be machine checked and proved. And so it's a quite a long process, and you only want to do that for the things that work to start with. So how do you, how do you test a kernel? It sounds simple, right? You turn your board on, first thing. Then you load the kernel onto it that you want to test, along with a payload. Because kernels don't, our kernel doesn't do anything. You need something on top of it that exercises the features that you want to test and report whether they worked or not. Then you run the thing and capture the output, compare the output with something that you know is good, and power down and start again. This all sounds pretty good, right? And the problem is that all those instructions out there for using the BeagleBone Black or the Odroid XU or the TK1 assume that you're running an Ubuntu desktop and you've got the board next to you and there's a USB cable in between. And you can push the button whenever things go wrong. If you've got 20 of these sitting in a server cabinet so far, you need very long arms to reach around the corner <laughs> and go through the door to push the button. And if you've got all of them on USB, the order of USB enumeration isn't stable. So this boot, you might get the TK1 on USB TTY0 and the Odroid on TTY USB2. Next boot, it might be the other way around. And you don't know. So for x86, it's fine, right? You've got server class machines, mostly retired from production, and they've got baseboard management controllers. Baseboard managed controllers give you a way to reboot. Unfortunately, server class machines tend to reboot really slowly. It can take five or six minutes between doing the power up command and having it to start pixie booting. And I don't know why, but the more powerful machi the machine, the longer it takes to boot. So these ones have got like four cores in them. They take about five minutes. Um, down below, which is just cut off below the thing, we've got a 56 core one. It takes 10 minutes to boot. So what we've done now is, instead of that, use desktop machines on an APC power bar, which you can control via Telnet or SNMP to, to turn on and off the various ports. The typical desktop machine can boot in about a minute and a half. So that's pretty nice. But what about all those ARM boards? We started out by using the same APC power bar and a plug pack per gadget that we have plugged in. Right? That sounds like it works, right? And it did work for a little bit, but it got very expensive very fast. First, most of these things want 5 volts at about 4 amps. Try and find that with a real Australian plug on it. There's a Chinese plug that looks almost like the Australian one, but it's got slightly thinner things, so they fall out. Hence, lots of Velcro. Second, our tests take about 90 seconds to run. So you're rebooting these things about every two or three minutes, 24 by 7. Those things go bang. <laughs> Third problem. We have a testing and tagging team that comes around every year and uh, tries to make sure that everything is kosher and assorted to our standards. When they find those Chinese ones, they throw them out. That gets expensive too. So we designed a switcheroo. We bought a cheap relay board off eBay, about $5. A you know that we happen to have lying around. An AT power supply out of a machine we were going to throw, throw out anyway, because an AT power supply gives you 5 volts at about 30 amps. So you can probably drive 10 boards off that. Um, and we're just restricting it to 8. 
And that works really well. I'll show you what it looks like. We, it looks like this. Right? We built it on a bit of perf board. There's also um, LEDs to show what's what and local control with a push button. We got a CSE, a, a computer science student, to build it. He's not that good with a soldering iron, but he managed. Um, and it works. And it's beautiful. Um, because we, we started out with this plugged into one of our servers, but because we moved, the server went to a server cabinet at Medfern, and all our, of our experimental boards went to Kensington. So we had to do something about that because we couldn't really have a very long USB cable. So we put a QB truck in there as well to do this. And that was fine when we only had eight boards to work with. But we built another one, and now we've got two of these things. Um, Arduino talks via USB, and USB enumeration order isn't stable. And every now and then after a power outage or something, we'd start switching the wrong ones. Not good. But anyway, it works for now. So this is what it looks like. This thing's all open hardware, all open source. The code you can get from there. Um, it's a five dollar switch. The whole, the whole thing costs less than $60. And that counts the second hand um, uh, AT power supply. Um, one little thing to watch. If you want to power cycle these boards quickly, you need to be able to discharge all the capacitors that are in there. Otherwise, it doesn't properly uh, reboot. So you wire the relays like this. Right? So when the, when the relay's off, the power is actually gets to earth. And that discharges all the capacitors for you. And that way, you only have to have it off for a few seconds before you reboot it. Otherwise, you've got to wait a couple of minutes sometimes. Uh, and even then, you can't be sure that everything's reset. So that's just a little gotcha. The other gotcha we found was things like the NVIDIA TX1 and a couple of other boards where just turning on the power isn't enough. You need to turn on the power and 300 milliseconds after the power is stable, you need to push the button. So we had to build one of these. That's actually not too bad. Um, you know, we, we happen to have some 2N7000s flying around. We built it up on a bit of error board and it works nicely. The way it works is, I'll show you if I can make this work. Oh, maybe I can't make it work. Oh, here we go. I'll make that bit bigger. When, when the 12 volt rail is zero volts, all of the capacitors are discharged. So there's zero volts about across them. When you turn the power supply on, this capacitor C1 is still at zero volts. So the gate of Q1 is pulled up to 12 volts and it turns it on. So the voltage there is zero because it's, you know, it's shorted to earth through the, through the transistor. The resistor capacitor network here gradually charges up that capacitor. And when it reaches whatever the trigger voltage is for the, um, for the transistor, which is about 300 milliseconds on, this transistor turns off because the voltage there is low then. And that starts charging up this, tra this one. That capacitor is at zero volts at that point, so it pulls that down. And 300 milliseconds later, it releases it again. And then after that, both of the transistors are off and everything works. Neat, easy. Uh, that circuit took a little bit of while to nut out because at first I had everything around the wrong way. And I, didn't, and I misread the spec because I thought it said that um, you had to hold it off for 300 milliseconds before, before letting it go. And that didn't work. Anyway, so there. there. Um, so now we have a way of turning on and off all the devices and resetting them. Great. Next thing we've got to do is capture the output. Now, the serial port on your computer runs RS-232. RS-232 voltages are up to 25 volts differential, plus 25 volts to minus 25 volts. You generally generate plus or minus 12, but you have to be able to receive up to plus or minus 25 because of ringing on the lines. So, some of the boards actually generate RS-232, the, the Sabre light does. But most of the others are at TTL levels. They don't really mean TTL levels. TTL means plus or minus 5 volts, so 0 to 5 volts. What they mean is 1.8 or 3.3 or 5 volts, depending on which board it happens to be. Most of the literature suggests using FTDI cables. They convert USB through a serial converter to one of those voltage levels. And depending on which one you buy and how much you spend, you can get either 3.3 or 5 or 1.8 volts. A real FTD cable 
FDI, FDDI cable costs a fortune, about $30. And when you've got 20 odd machines, that adds up real fast. So we wanted a cheaper approach. Uh, the other, so you could get you know, uh, just a level converter to serial. Uh, but how do you know which one is which? That's the other problem. The problem with that is that there aren't that many multi-port serial cards on the market anymore. And the few that are are very expensive. And the ones you can buy off the second-hand market, like the old stallion cards that used to be made up into one, no longer have drivers. And the driver that's in the kernel is totally bit rotted and doesn't work. I know I tried it. So, so what do you do? Well, you look around on eBay, and we found this thing. It has 16 RS-422 ports, which all come out to an 8P8C connector, which is lovely. Plus, it's got a 10 base T Ethernet connector. And you just tell net to port 2002, and you get to port 2, and you can pick up the thing. It's lovely. We paid about $20 each for these on eBay. So in preparing for this talk, I looked them up on eBay again, see, see, see whether they were still things. Unfortunately, they've got rather expensive. Um, $700 for one of these, just before Christmas. They've come down a little bit now. They're about $300 now. But I don't know. Anyway, we happen to have three of these things. So we're going to use them. You still need to do level conversion. Uh, oh, we use the ConServer software, which some of you will know, for actually talking to this thing and picking up the consoles. Um, if you haven't used ConServer for talking to all your consoles, do. It's great. Essentially, you've got a server that knows how to talk to all the different consoles, whether they're serial or telnet or via IPMI or whatever. Um, it then logs everything that happens in a file in var log conserver slash whatever the machine name is. And you've got a conserver client that you can talk to the conserver server, and it does arbitration between multiple people. So everybody can be read only, and one person can get the right access to that console. And that's really, really useful in this kind of environment. So, yeah. So, well, how are you going to do voltage conversion? Well, search on eBay. You can find one of these gadgets. They're about $2. They've got two problems, though. Um, can you see any mounting holes on that thing? <laughs> no. So, no mounting holes. And they only do 3.3 and 5 volts. There's no 1.8 volts there, and about half our machines are 1.8 volts. So, oh, and you also need an adapter to hook up to the ETS16P. Um, you can get those off eBay. They're about $2 each, but they come unwired. So it takes you about 15 minutes to wire up each one. And that becomes expensive in terms of fiddliness, uh, because you also need to use a soldering iron. And for various reasons, our hardware lab was decommissioned and hasn't been recommissioned yet, because we moved buildings. So it's a real pain. So we built these things. <laughs> Again, designed and built by a computer science student. Can you tell? <laughs> this is essentially a Max 218CP chip. That's a chip which does 1.8 volt or 3.3 volt or 5 volt to RS-232 levels. It has two drivers in each direction. So because we only care about receive and transmit data, we can drive two gadgets of each one of these things. But they've both got to be the same voltage. So we can drive two 1.8 volts or two 3.3 volts. It's pretty neat. This particular one is designed to hook directly onto the Odroid. So those two connectors there are the same as the serial port on the Odroid. So it makes it easy. So what we've got so far? We've got a remote controlled power supply, and we've got all our serial consoles. That should be enough. Except we've also got a big mess. <laughs> That's what it looks like at the moment. Uh, and the problem with that is, it's hard to find which board is which, even though they're all labeled. So if you want to actually plug in a gadget and you know, connect something to the USB or to one of the SPI pins or something like that. And it's quite fragile in terms, if you go in and move this board, that board there gets adjusted and it doesn't work anymore. So we need something better. So come on, version two. Recently on the market have come these gadgets. Um, this is an eight-way relay board that is powered, that is controlled by a serial. It's got on it a PL2031 converter, so you can talk to it via USB. But I don't like USB for this because, it, because of the stability problem. So just next to it, you can see a four, four pins. 
That comes unpopulated, but if you populate it, you can talk to it via TTL level serial. In this case, it really is 5 volts. And you just send commands to say, turn this relay on, turn that relay off, and Bob's your uncle. We've got an eight-way relay board that we can control via serial. Great. The other problem was that serial driver didn't look very neat, and it wasn't very compact. So we designed this. This does exactly the same thing, but this time we got an electrical engineering student to design it. <laughs> it's, got the same, it's got the same circuit, but it looks much neater. And this time we, we're using the uh, same 8P8C sockets as the Lantronics thing, so we can just hook up a, a, a straight through cable between them. And straight through cables are cheap. Um, we got the PCB managed by Mike Mitch's company, Hackvana. If you get your PCBs manufactured and you're not very good at making PCBs, it's really good because he inspects them and he tells you what's wrong with them. Before, we used to use PC cart and places like that, and you'd send off a, a, a design and it would come back and it wouldn't work. And the reason it wouldn't work is because you had two traces too close together and they bridged, or you'd made the trace too thin and it had, wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't any copper there. Mike will actually check the design rules and tell you when things aren't working. And he'll give you improvements to say, if you just shrink it like this, we can give you 20% off because it fits into a standard size. Or if you um, do this, that, or the other, if, these ones, for example, we used to have them individual boards. And he said, no, just give us one of for eight and put score marks on there so you can just break them off and it'll be cheaper. So he, he's great that way. Anyway, that's, that, that's enough of a plug for that. This is open hardware. You can get the Gerba files and the Altium source files from that URL. And um, this one worked first time. It's the first time in ages we've built a board that worked first time. It's lovely. So what we've got now is the start of a new layout. Uh, this was a picture from yesterday. It came in yesterday night after people had started to wire it up. It's one big sheet of MDF, about 1,800 high by 900 wide. Uh, at the top, we have a, uh, a, a, an Ethernet switch, the Lantronics, and the power supply. Right at the top, there's a power board. Um, and that way, we can just have two wires coming in, uh, an Ethernet wire and a, a power cable, which means it's going to be really easy to pick up and take to trade shows and show off, which is kind of nice. Uh, and then all of the other things are attached by Velcro. That's got two effects. Firstly. If you've got MDF and you screw stuff into it and then unscrew it, then screw it back in and screw, unscrew it, the MDF hole sort of gets bigger and bigger until the screw no longer fits. With the Velcro, you don't need to worry about that. And it's really easy to take things off without any tools, which is great when somebody's bothered your screwdriver, which happens regularly. And the Intel board wiring and so forth isn't very neat yet. It's going to be tidied up and look really beautiful. But it does exactly the same thing as it did before. So now we have all that we need for doing the integration, except for the software. What we want is some sort of standard so we can boot all these things up using the same software for all of them and have all the continuous integration having happen for all of them the same. We want serial output and input at 1500 kiloboard. We want the thing to auto boot when the power is supplied, which we've talked about before. And we want to be able to boot via TFTP so that people can do their development, create their image, dump it in a TFTP boot directory, push the button, and have it boot. They don't have to fiddle around putting things on USB keys or SD cards and then walking over and plugging them in. So what that ended up being was a lot of work on my part on fixing U-boots. <laughs> the other thing is that because we're doing hypervisors on top of ARM, we wanted where possible, where the machine's architecture allowed it, to boot in non-secure mode so you can actually run those hypervisor extensions. And U-boot doesn't come that way by default, primarily because it involves turning on the power state control interface in the kernel, uh, and most kernels don't ship with that enabled in their default configs. So if you enable the hypervisor extension, Linux won't boot. So we modified U-boot. What I found is the U-boot community is really good. It's relatively easy to get good patches upstream. They'll review them for you, tell you what's wrong, and will eventually merge them. Uh, and that's lovely. Um, I've got great respect for them. They're, they're great people. 
but it can break Linux booting, as I said. So what we've done is provided an environment variable, um, bootm nonsec, I think it's called. And you just set that environment variable. If you set it to nonsec, then it'll boot in non-secure mode. If you set it to sec, it'll boot in secure mode. And so if you're booting Linux, you just set it to the right mode. And if you're booting SEL4, you set it to the other mode. Or if you're booting Linux with the right configuration, you can set it to insecure mode. And that's lovely. The other thing is we want to be able to boot ELF files via TFTP. U-boot is very, very configurable. And different manufacturers choose to configure it in different ways. And this one will configure it so it'll only boot Z image. This person will configure it so it'll only boot fast boot images. This one will configure it so it needs U images. We want them all to boot ELF. So we've added that and pushed those things upstream so the boot ELF command's enabled. That's pretty good. An interesting case in port point is this board, the, CE, the Colorado Engineering TK1 SOM. It's a little thing, 50 millimeters aside. Well, they say two inches, but I'm metric. 50 mil, it's a 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter cube that has an NVIDIA TK1 um, chip on it. They, because it's open source, they have to give you the source code to the thing. So if you buy one of these things, they'll give you an FTP link and a password to get the source for the U-boot that's running on it which is fine, except that when I actually wanted to use that U-boot, I wanted to use the upstream U-boot, not that one, because, you know, we're an open source group. So the first thing to do is to try and reverse engineer what they've changed. Um, and they've changed lots and lots and lots of stuff. So you search around on the net and you find one that's sort of similar to what they've done, and you work out what the changes are from that one. And then you take just those changes, which turned out to be about a 10-line change, and port it forward to the current U-boot and see if it worked. And it did. <laughs> there were 10 lines that I needed to change. <laughs> so that's now upstream. Uh, the CEI TK1 SOM is now fully supported in U-boot upstream, which is nice. The other thing about this thing is it's only got one mounting hole here. And we wanted to mount this thing on top of a quadcopter. We didn't think one mounting top hole was going to be enough. So we designed a daughter board and took the daughter board, which is like that, turn each of these upside down and the, use the, um, the connectors, which are fairly solid, to stop it from rotating. Screw that down with one screw and then use four screws to attach that to the, um, the top. Uh, this board is also open hardware, available at the same URL as the other ones. Um, it's also got a whole heap of stuff that's useful for flying on a drone, like IMUs and compasses and gyros and stuff like that there. And CAN bus, so you can talk to CAN ECUs on each of the motors. So, so that's pretty nice, but it's an aside from what I'm trying to do now. Right, we want to make this easy to use for developers. So what we've developed is this thing called reboot.py. I haven't made this open source because it's very specific to us, but the ideas might be more useful to you. Vboot.py provides a class, console class, that has these virtual methods. Reboot only, which all it does is power cycle the machine. Boot cell 4 and boot Linux, which do whatever's necessary to load SEL4 or Linux onto the machine and start it up. And a shutdown method, which turns the machine off. Those methods need to be specified and instantiated for each individual board. So here's the one for the saver. We set up some variables. We say what the name of the device is. That's the console device name. So when you say console saver, you get the saver's console. And the, all the configuration in the cons server knows which port to telnet to to get that information. The power bar command is the massive shell script we've got to turn on and off those relays. So reboot saver just turns it on and turns it off, and you're done. Uh, likewise, the off. The uboot prompt is what to look for on the console output so that you know there's things in uboot mode, so we can actually start sending things to, um, to, to boot it. Without that, you wouldn't know when you boot had fi finished and had a prompt there. And, and that's about it. So reboot only runs self.reboot command, which is that one. 
uses the expect command to look for hit any key to, to stop booting, and then sends a key when it sees that, and then expects the prompt, and that's it. Easy, eh? Boot cell 4 first calls that thing, so we, we end up in the uBoot prompt, and we haven't booted into anything. Um, sets up some environment variables, enables the Ethernet, and then calls TFTP boot, which fetches things from the server into your thing, and then sends boot elf command. Right? And you can script any of them in more or less the same way. So how does it all fit together? Well, we happen to be using a few bits of proprietary software. Uh, the reason for that is that before about 2007, people weren't using any kind of continuous integration or tools at all. And even though I've been trying to push for it for about seven years at that stage. But a young engineer named Anna Lyons came from, from Atlassian, she'd been working there, and said, we can do this better. And she managed to persuade everybody that we can use some tools to make this better. And because she was from Atlassian, she already knew Bamboo, Jira, and Bitbucket, and she persuaded us all to use them, which was great. And I was cheering all the way to the, to the bit repository because any tool is better than no tool and any kind of disciplined process is better than nothing. And so we use these tools. Bamboo is our continuous integration server. It has several thousand tests which are specialized for all these boards. And normally, in the background, it's running all these things. That's really nice. Bitbucket is like GitHub, but internal. And it holds all of our projects and all the branches that people are working on. Jira is the issue tracking stuff. So when you raise an issue on GitHub for SEL4 or any of its code, or put a pull request up there, they're pulled into our internal systems and then tested. Um, so we still want individuals to be able to work on this stuff. So we've got a workflow. We've got this thing called machine queue, which doesn't actually do any machine queuing anymore. It used to. All it does now is acquire a lock. So you call MQ on a particular board, and it will lock that board and give you exclusive access until you release it. It then talks to the Lantronics and to the switcheroo to do all the stuff you need. So as a developer, your workflow might be MQ run dash S, that's the system, machine name. So we say MQ dash S save a light one or something. Uh, dash F, and then some image name that you've just built. And this is what MQ does. First, it gets the lock. If it can't get the lock, it'll eventually time out. It tries over and over again. It gets the lock. This is all uh, shell script. It gets the lock by SSHing to a machine and trying to create a directory. Creating a directory is atomic. If the directory is already there, it'll tell you, it'll look up who owns it and tell you directory owned by Bamboo or directory owned by Adrian or whatever. Um, or lock owned, sorry. Anyway, it'll, it waits about three minutes and, other, and, and gives up at the end of that time. Um, after it's got the lock, it copies your image into slash TFTP boot slash machine name slash self of image. It then invokes reboot.py in that same directory. And that reboot.py is a symlink to the one that actually knows how to talk to that particular machine. Uh, the reboot.py acquires the console, power cycles the uh, board, waits for uBoot to finish, loads the kernel, and runs it. In order to do that, it has to acquire the console. It will leave you in a console buffer so you can actually see what's going on. You can also give there uh, a string to look for if the test worked. So you can say, OK, search for all's well in the universe, which is what you get when cell 4 test runs to completion and passes everything. Um, and if you do that, then you'll get a, an exit zero status out of run dot shell, so you can put it into a script and do more scripting. Um, we showed you the uh, TFTP boot stuff. There are also machines that have got PXE built into U-boot, like the, the, the NVIDIA boards. For those ones, instead, what you do is you adjust menu.list to point to your new file system and then invoke PXE boot just another way of doing it. And there are two machines that have to use fastboot. 
Fastboot's this way of loading a kernel over USB. The reason they need to do that is they're using LK, not U-boot, and LK is in mass programmed ROM, so I can't change it. The other problem with that one is all of those machines, they're the high key ones that I don't like, have the same fast boot identifier. They're all 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. Because of that, we had to add extra machine queue locking just for those machines so you only talk to one of them at a time. Otherwise, you don't know which one's which. And because it's USB, we needed, instead of putting it into the um, slash TFTP boot slash machine name, we need to copy it onto that QB truck that I mentioned before and get it to invoke the fastboot command to talk to the actual gadget. So that's how we solved that. And if there's a better way, I'd like to know it. So that's what we do. Meanwhile, Bamboo's doing all of its thing. It runs the verification regression overnight. The verification regression takes 30 hours to run if it runs a complete test of all of the machine checked proof bits we've got. Typically, verification users uh, are verifying just their little bit, and they check that. And then they will push the change as a, as a change request, and Bamboo will run in the background checking that the entire proof still works. It's fairly easy when you add a proof of a bit of 64-bit code to break the proof for the 32-bit version. Or if you push a bit for x86, it breaks the proof for ARM or the other way around. So we needed to do something like that. Um, you can also ask it to run ad hoc tests. So you can just go to the Bamboo website and say, OK, I want to queue tests on this branch of my version of the repository on these three machines. And it'll do that and tell you afterwards. So you don't have to be sitting there typing at it. And the other thing that it does is it tells you when things go wrong. Um, it will put it into the HipChat, which is our inst internal messaging system, queue. So you can see that this test failed. And so we end up with the board I showed you at the beginning. And we can see that two of the eight tests failed, and the names of them, the cell 4 HS and cell 4 PC99 SIM are the two runs that failed. Um, HS is the Sabre board, sorry, is the um, high key 64 bit port, so that one failed. And the Cell 4 PC99 SIM is QMU running the x86 32 bit port. So those two test runs failed. Uh, and by default, we run on eight different platforms. Um, the verification team is also broken. Uh, the L4 verified has failed on the external GitHub. And that's really, really bad. Uh, theoretically, nothing should be pushed out from our system unless it, it, all the boards green. What happened was, because of a network outage, things hadn't been pushed out. So someone went and pushed them out manually. And they pushed from the tip instead of from the last verified version. So we ended up for about four hours with a, uh, a bad kernel out on external GitHub. And that was annoying. But Bamboo caught it. <laughs> so we knew, so we could fix it. Uh, and that one there, the four days ago, is the time since everything was green and an automatic push was done out to GitHub. So what happens now is all of our people are internally be beavering away, doing all their stuff. But this is a community project, so people do report bugs. They do provide pull requests and enhancements and things like that. What we do with those is we pull them in automatically. So there's a, there's a robot maintainer there that pulls things in and sticks it into our internal Bitbucket server. So we've got the branch. And then that runs all the tests so we can see whether it actually worked or not. And only after that do we actually spend time reviewing it. There's not much point reviewing a, uh, a pull request that doesn't even compile. So it reduces our workload because we know the thing worked, and then we can just look at it for stylistic thing and whether it's going to be provable and whether it matches the C subset that we, we enforce for the provable parts of the system. Most of the pull requests we've got so far have not been for the provable part of the system. 
They've all been for the non-provable bits in the libraries or uh, in the user space stuff. So that's it. The other things around here are what's currently running. So the L4 regression, the L4V regression, Isabel 2016, that's the proof, and it's been running for 101 minutes, and we estimate there's another 300 minutes to go, almost. So that's pretty neat. The graph is of the IPC performance of the SEL4 kernel on the Sabre. Um, the bottom is just call, the top one line is call reply. We monitor that, we don't want it to go up because the IPC fast path, if it's not fast, every system you build on SEL4 is going to be slow. So we want that as fast as possible. That's in cycles. So it's showing about 200 cycles for a call and about 300 cycles for a call reply, which is not too bad. Um, it should be lower than that, but that's not too bad. So that's it. That's our system. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions? Stunned mullets? Yeah. yeah. Question as much as a comment, but those uh, those serial boxes you've got must have been from the ARC. They seem to have an AUI connector. Yes, they the are. Ethernet, so. um, what, what happened was, uh, back in the dark ages, all those point of sale terminals all taught serial. And Lantronic sold into that market. So for decades, Woolworths and so forth would have point of sale servers, ter servers point of tail terminals running serial back to one of those switches which then talked into the, into the network to talk to their servers. Uh, and then when they started replacing those with things that ran Windows inside or whatever, um, a whole heap of them came onto the market so they were really cheap. But they're ideal for what we want. Uh, even if you're running 16 ports to 115 kiloboard, it's still a long way less than 10 megabit. Any other questions? So you've got, when you run your um, cell, you've got the Linux and the trusted stuff. Um, I know that people are using that to run uh, IP networks from Linux to the trusted stuff. Mm -hmm. How on earth are they managing it with your semantics? Uh, we have VChan implemented, which looks like uh, the, the VertIO layers. And so there's a shared buffer between the two. Um, w so you can talk through that. We don't run IP between them because then you'd have to implement an entire trusted IP stack. We do have, or well, sorry, we are in the process of developing such a thing, but it's a way off yet. Uh, so at the moment it's that. Or um, most of the communication we've seen has just been very short messages, like 32-bit messages. Uh, and for that, you can just stick it in a register and arrange an IPC path. Yeah, well, for, for our system, it's, it's more the small stuff. Um, the, bit the biggest use case is on Qualcomm chipset phones. If you have a phone now with a Qualcomm chipset, you're running our code, and it does exactly that architecture. So Android's running in the untrusted side, and the software-defined radio and the other control stuff's running in the other side. And there's a very, very narrow channel between them so that your dialer can actually dial stuff, and the SMSs can get back up and be seen. And that's about all. Hi, your, uh, your Colorado engineering TK1 yep. breakout thing that you mentioned, 50. Yeah. Um, how does that go for heat? Because didn't the TK1s get pretty hot on their own and they were quite a yep. bit bigger and well laid out? So. Um, as it comes, it's got a whopping great fan on top. Yeah. We take that off Sorry. and for most of our use cases, we only need one core and we don't need the GPU. Oh. The only reason we're using these chips is because they've got the ARM um, virtualization extensions and they've got a system MMU that works. Uh, they're the first available arm um, that's got a, a real system MMU that everything's on, everything that can do DMA is on the other side of. Uh, and if you've got a secure system, if you can't secure DMA as well, then it might as well not be secured. Uh, all the other systems, the system MMU tends to travel, cover only the graphics. And so all the other DMA sources can DMA to anywhere. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I think that's time.